Hello everyone, I'm Michael Sarabio. Ottawa will once again feel the presence of the self-described Freedom Convoy this weekend. It's not known how many people will participate this time around, but those who attend will be remembering the protests that occupied the parliamentary precinct in 2022, while also marking the two-year anniversary of the Trudeau government's use of the Emergencies Act to break that protest up. I believe Canada itself changed very dramatically on that last day, two years ago on the 17th. Because what had occurred is we had our ruling government weaponize police officers, weaponize the establishment, and weaponize the, <clears throat> the justice system against its own people. Now, these were people that our prime minister labeled many words, called them a threat, said we couldn't go on trains, said we couldn't fly, all because we challenged and we wanted, basically, our own health. We weren't willing to take something. Well, joining us now is our weekly journalist panel. Robert Fife is the Auto Bureau Chief for the Globe and Mail, Catherine Levesque, parliamentary reporter for the National Post, and Joël Denis Bellevance, the Auto Bureau Chief for La Presse. Hello to the three of you. Thanks Hello. for having us. So we're, let's begin with the, the, the protest organizers speaking, you know, ahead of their weekend protests, revisiting what is essentially the two-year anniversary of the invocation of the Emergencies Act. Last month, we had that court ruling that basically said that there was government overreach. You know, it, it makes me wonder, as we look towards this weekend, Bob, do you think Canadian attitudes have changed at all regarding the protest and the objectives of what they are trying to accomplish? No, I don't think. I think the vast majority of people certainly was not supportive of the actions of the, the trucker convoy, uh, you know, holding the city hostage. And even worse, when they tried to block the Windsor Bridge, which is the most important economic corridor between Canada and the United States, there's no sympathy for, uh, for these people. Um, and all the polls have consistently showed that. So the government is not going to really get into any trouble on that issue, it seems to me. Um, but having said that, I mean, I never felt that the Emergency Act was necessary, and I was glad that the court ruled the way they did because the police were able to deal with uh, the Windsor situation and the Coots, Alberta situation, and I think, was, I think the judge was right in that it was overreach. Um, but in these, these, these people are uh, some of the, the remnants of the truck convoy, which I think that's what I think you really would call them, um, are a kind of a fringe group uh, of people who are angry at the world. And um, but I, I don't think they're going to have. I don't think they'll have much of an impact, frankly. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll we'll see because Bruce and Pudding is again the weekend here. But what do you guys make of the return of the organizers and Canadian attitudes towards you know the the, the trucker protest with 2020 hindsight, Catherine? I mean, we always have some protesters around Parliament Hill. I mean, sometimes it's a handful of people, so we'll see this weekend how many there there are. But really, uh, it's it's interesting because it, this group has really mutated into something else. I mean, they're really protesting now against all kinds of government overreach, in their opinion. So we're talking about uh, gender politics. We're talking about the environment. You know, there are people who are really mad about the effects of climate change, electric vehicles on our roads and all that, but also uh, perceived attacks on uh, Canada's sovereignty. So that's why we'll see, and even today we, we saw banners of, uh, you know, people who didn't want to be part of the World Economic Forum. So really the, this... This is this movement has really changed and it's just there are so many causes. I mean, there are no more vaccine mandates, so they can't really protest against that. But, you know, they're asking that Justin Trudeau step down. They're asking that, you know, we basically take back Canada and they're, they're just protesting a bit of everything right now. Uh, so I, I just find it really interesting that that has changed. And certainly we, we see that. Um, that reflected in the current Conservative Party at the moment. You know, MPs like Les Lewis will champion some of these issues, like pulling out of the United Nations, things like that. So, uh, but still, I, I will agree with Bob. It does remain a relatively fringe issue, and I think polls have showed that, uh, you know, Canadians' opinions really haven't changed on the use of the Emergencies Act and uh, the fallout of the, the convoy. Yeah, it's interesting that you guys use the word fringe because they, they, they certainly we're, we're seeing something much, much smaller, at least in the early get-go of going into this weekend. 
But at the same time, there's a durability about those that remain. And it, it seems that it has to do with the issues you're talking about. You know, Joe Denis, talk to us about the CSIS briefing that was revealed earlier this week, because it does indicate where this movement or those who remain with it are, are going towards. Yeah, I think there is still some uh, uh, concerns among security uh, forces establishment about the action of those groups. And that's why you're probably going to see a lot of uh, uh, poly, uh, police forces deployed in downtown Ottawa or wherever they are. Uh, it's good to say though that uh, last year they tried to mark the first anniversary, it fizzled. Uh, and then another group tried to mark a six months anniversary in motorcycles. cycles, it fizzled. I think most Canadians have moved on. Mm -hmm. The pandemic is over. We're very happy that it's over. And most of us have moved on to something else. There are something more urgent now uh, among uh, in the mind of Canadians like the war in Ukraine, the war between Israel and Hamas, and the possible return of Donald Trump in the White House. So those are more concerns, and the economy, the cost of living. So we've moved on to something else. That's why, as my two colleagues mentioned, it has become a more French group that is uh, um, asking stuff about everything and nothing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Gaza, and actually that will bring me to the next point, away from this mm -hmm. protest, but really a controversy that happened this week on the Hill because Rob Oliphant, who's the Parliamentary Secretary to the Foreign Affairs Minister, uh, caught in a, a spe speaking with a constituent who secretly recorded their conversation and then shared it. And in that conversation, Rob Oliphant talks about his own personal struggles uh, and his own internal debate regarding the government response on both Israel and Gaza. A and before we begin our discussion, I want to share with people at home some of the political reaction we heard here in the nation's capital to that recording. Take a listen. It's another example of how Justin Trudeau is a two-faced phony on the Middle East, just like everything else. Trudeau has been absolutely incomprehensible on the Middle East. He has no clear position of any kind. If Mr. Oliphant, who has answered me multiple times in the House, multiple times in committee, if he actually believes that UNRWA should have their funding restored, that we should stop selling weapons to Israel, and that we should call for an immediate ceasefire, do everything we can, he should be brave enough to say it publicly, the way New Democrats have been saying it since October 11th. Okay, again, some of the reaction to, to this recording. You know, it, it makes me wonder about Rob Oliphant, uh, whether or not he might be shuffled out. Again, he, was, he wasn't speaking publicly. This was a private conversation. But private or not, will he have to be shuffled out, do you think? Uh, I'm not sure whether he will or not. I mean, what Rob Oliphant did was struggling, was struggling within himself, what we all are, about what's going on in the Middle East. Um, obviously, great concern for Israel and what happened uh, on October the 7th, but also a real uncomfortable feeling about what's happening in Gaza, the, the way that Israel is cracking down uh, and the use of military force that's left, what, 28, 30,000 people dead, many, many more wounded. Uh, it's becoming a humanitarian crisis. And I, th I thought what I saw in that conversation was somebody struggling with his own emotions about this very difficult situation. Now, he is at odds uh, partly with the government, um, but I don't know whether he'll be shuffled or not. Um, uh, I think because I think the government's doing the same thing around the cabinet table. So I can't, I don't think he's going to be punished for it. Um, I mean, I think Heather McPherson uh, made a good point, though, is that, you know, what's happened with UNRWA, you should come out and you feel you, you should say that. But it's, it's a little more difficult for him because he's the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and he doesn't really have the freedom to be able to be a backbench MP who can come out and say whatever he wants. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because, of course, his job is to defend government foreign policy given his role. Oh, what do you think of the situation, Catherine? I think on the on the forum he made a rookie mistake. I mean, he shouldn't be having those conversations with constituents if he's not prepared to have them publicly. Um, so I, I find he shared a lot, and you know he, he was really kind of a heart to heart with this constituent. And you know, we th there's always a risk that some of that might be might leak to the media. Um, and so I, I think he should have been really a lot more careful in, in what he said. Um, but uh, yeah, at the same time, I, I'm not sure he will be shuffled, or at least not right away. Uh, after all, I mean, the, I think the Liberal Caucus is very divided. I think uh, right now there's 
they're allowing their MPs to kind of speak their mind and to, you know, either make statements for Israel or for, you know, for more of the Palestinian side. So they're allowing this freedom of expression. But at the same time, I mean, you know, if, if other leaks resurface uh, with, with Rob Oliphant, I mean, I think ultimately uh, the, the prime minister, because he's the one naming the parliamentary secretaries, the ministers don't, um, he will maybe in an eventual shuffle, uh, you know, shuffle him out. Uh, but really what I've seen from MPs and, and, you know, everyone's kind of been on the same page with this is that Rob Oliphant, he's been parliamentary secretary since 2019. He's very knowledgeable. He's lived in the region. And frankly, he's he's an asset, but he's also uh, an MP for the, the GTA. So the, I don't think they want to be at odds with him. Yeah, you know, my observation of it is that, you know, Rob Oliphant, of course, has been on the Hill for a very long time. Amongst liberals, he's, he's very well liked. Uh, but what struck me was when the prime minister was asked about it in Winnipeg this week, the prime minister talked about and referenced the, the own internal debate that's happening right now in caucus, but he didn't say, oh, we stand with Rob Oliphant, Rob Oliphant has, doesn't have to worry. The, that was not a part of his response, so the, which had me wondering, I, I, what's your reaction to it? Well, like Bob said, I think Mr. Uh, Oliphant expressed the kind of agony that the liberal government is going through, but also the Canadian population. I think he's struggling with coming up with the right solution for a conflict that is far away, but is so divisive for Canadian population. And among the political parties in Ottawa, I think uh, say what you want, but I think the Liberal government is also a reflection of what Canadians think more. I don't see unity uh, like we see in the, in the NDP within the Canadian population. I don't see the same unity as I see in the Black Québécois within the population, nor in the Conservative Party. So if you look at the Liberal government as a whole, I think it's a reflection of where the Canadian population is. It's a very difficult issue. There's no simple answer to that conflict. And if you go too much on one side, you will get the other side to say, hey, you're going too far in that direction. So I think Mr. Oliphant was expressing that uh, uh, that difficulty. And I think I remain convinced that he's a very good asset for the government because he's a thoughtful man yeah. and he knows foreign policy. I think he was, he said, uh, if I'm correct in, uh, in the tape recording, that he has raised these issues privately with the minister, uh, so it wasn't like he was being a phony. Um, uh, you know, he'd raised these things privately. He just didn't expect somebody to, to uh, record his conversation and then put it out uh, or release it to the media. So I'm not sure that he's going to be punished for it, but uh, it depends really uh, on, um, on whether it takes a, gets a lot of traction. But I think it puts the government in a difficult situation himself because... This is Joel and Everett, we've all said. I mean, they're reflecting the opinions within the, in the caucus and, frankly, in Canadian society. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a few minutes left, but I do want to touch on the last subject here. And this has to do with GC Strategies, of course, the company behind the Arrive Can app. Because, Joel Denis, uh, you, you broke the story this week uh, talking about the number of contracts, what, 140 contracts since yeah. 2015, worth a yeah. quarter of a billion dollars to a company that is essentially two people and two employees. You know, uh, there's still more questions than answers here, but is this a black eye on the government or is this merely a black eye on the public service for, for, for at least with the ArriveCan app, spending so much money, investing so much money with this company, Bob? Look, it's a black eye on the government. Where's the ministerial responsibility here? Everybody's blaming these bureaucrats and rightly so. This was an absolute mess from, as the governor general, as the auditor general has said, and other uh, experts who have looked at this. But there is ministerial responsibility. You oversaw these bureaucrats. We knew when this arrive cam happened years ago that it was a boondoggle and a mess, and nobody takes any responsibility for it. So I think it's yes, the you know whatever the RCMP end up doing and charges are laid, uh, that's fine. But where is the ministerial responsibility? Because they are running for the running for cover and blaming all the bureaucrats. Okay. Yeah, right. Catherine, oh, actually, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on on uh, Bob's uh, mention. There is uh, one thing that came out very strongly this week, throughout the whole week, with the report from the Auditor General and stories about the number of contracts and the amount of money. It is disputed by the government that the amount of money that I put out, uh, but still. There is a very much so a lack of accountability within this government. 
and we have to rely on external institutions to have the answers, like the RCMP or the Auditor, Auditor General. What about answers from the ministers responsible for that file? Where are they? They're just saying that, oh, we know that something went wrong, but and we are implementing the recommendations. That's the usual phrase that comes out after every single report from the Auditor General. So uh, this is something fundamental, lack of accountability, ministerial uh, uh, accountability, and this is becoming a problem in Ottawa. Okay, last uh, 20 seconds to you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a lack of transparency for me. I mean, even the Auditor General couldn't pin the exact number of like, how much did it cost uh, to, to make this uh, this app. And so, I, I you know, I don't expect us to just kind of sweep this under the rug. I think this will continue and we should be demanding, uh, rightfully so, more answers and more transparency from the government. Okay, uh, I'm going to demand for more table banging from Bob. <laughs> <laughs> if everyone part, when the House of Commons used to do that on a daily and we finally get it from Bob Five here on the show. Here's a problem. Frustration. <laughs> Built up. <laughs> Robert Pike, Catherine Lebeck, Josie Bellevance, thank you very much.